So we've been talking so far about trying to find formal definitions for what it actually means to compute something. And very early on in the semester, we gave one idea for what it looked like to compute things. And to, in order to have a vague idea of what it looked like to compute things, we had to say, what is a thing that gets computed? So before we could talk about what it meant to compute something, we had to say, what is the type of thing that we might compute? And we started by saying, well, that type of thing that we might compute, that was going to be taking a string as input. Why did we take a string as input? Why did we like strings? Yeah, because pretty much anything that we could, that we could ever want to write down, we could represent with a string. Our like, English language is sort of built on strings. We have text with characters that can be strings. So basically, anything that humans can think about, we can write down as a string somehow. So we liked strings for that amount of generality that we had. We could use strings to represent music or numbers or anything that we wanted. If we can have a model of computing that operates on strings, then so long as we can figure out how to represent the actual thing we want to compute on as a string, then we can compute on whatever we'd like. So we said that the things that we computed was going to be some function that took a string as input and produced a string as output. The strings, we say, are going to be some sequence of characters. Those characters are drawn from some alphabet. And this alphabet is always going to be finite in our definition of a string. So there's always a finite number of things in our alphabet. So somebody asked this question on the previous slide. Is it a finite alphabet? So this, this one here, they asked, is it a finite alphabet? The answer to that is always yes. So this is a yes or no question for which the answer is never no. We want to compute some function that takes strings as input, produces strings as output. This sigma star here says zero or more things from the alphabet, a sequence of zero or more things from the alphabet. So sigma star was sigma to the zero power, uh, union sigma to the one, union sigma to the two, and so forth. Sequences of zero or more things from the alphabet. And for circuits, we in particular talked about the alphabet being bits, 0 and 1. And then we were restricting the input and output size to be a fixed size. So when we had the star, that meant any finite length string, as opposed to when we put like the n here, that means only these fixed length strings. So that's what we've been working with so far. We're going to expand this a little bit next. So these are different ways to think about what is the same thing, but there's going to be some advantages to thinking about what we're computing in a slightly different way. So it's going to be equivalent to what we've talked about so far, but we're going to think about it in a slightly different way. When we have a function that computes on the domain of strings, and then the codomain is bits like true or false, or zero or one, or something like that. We call those decision problems. This particular kind of function where our input is going to be whatever, whatever string, and our output is going to be either zero or one, we call those decision problems. Because we're just trying to essentially decide whether or not the given string is going to have some property. Any question for which there is a yes or no answer, any question of strings for which the answer is yes or no, we call that a decision problem. So functions where the output is Boolean or binary. All of these questions that we asked up here, all of these are decision problems because we're asking a question about a string. So we can think of each of the questions up here as a function, where what our function is going to do is it's going to accept some sort of string as input. It's going to take in some sort of string as input. And provided the answer to whatever question we asked was yes, it is going to give as the result true or one. Whenever the answer was no, it's going to give as the result zero or false. We call these decision problems. Most of the functions that we've been talking about so far have secretly been decision problems all along. We're also going to be talking about another slightly different idea, which is this idea of a language. A language is just a set of strings. So a language in this context is just a set of strings. And in particular, we define a language by saying the property that all of those strings are going to have. So a language is some set of strings. This is different from what you might think of as like a spoken language or a programming language, where a language is maybe a bunch of vocab words plus the ways that you arrange them together to make meaningful statements. What we're going to be talking about here when we refer to the word language in this context as something that we compute, 
we're essentially just saying this is only the vocab. You hand me a string and I just want to know, is it one of the words that's in my set? A language is just some set of words. All of these things are sort of related to one another. Functions, decision problems, languages, and so forth. Any of the things we've discussed so far, we could think about them in any of these contexts and we'd get basically the same properties. So for instance, I could look at XOR and we could think of the generalized XOR. So an XOR where I can hand it any number of inputs I want rather than just two. You can think of it as a binary string of arbitrary length. And the decision version of this might be, are there an odd number of ones in the string? So XOR for an arbitrary number of input bits should return one whenever the number of ones was odd and it should return zero whenever the number of ones was even. So to express this as like a decision problem, we're asking this yes or no question, are there an odd number of ones? And if I were to represent that as a function instead, then this would be a function where we take some bit string as input and we'd say that the output should be zero whenever the number of ones was even and one whenever the number of ones was odd. Or I could think of this same thing as a language where I said it's the set of all strings from sigma star, in this case, sigma would be equal to zero and one. So it's the set of all strings from sigma star such that that string has, oops, an odd number of ones. Or if we talked about majorities, I'm gonna give you a bunch of bits and I want to know if I gave you more ones than zeros in my bit string. So that was this majority function. So as a decision problem, it asks of this string, are there more ones than zeros? As a function, it could be something like the function returns zero if the string has more zeros than ones or the same number as, as more or equal, or it returns one if there's more ones than zeros. I could think of this as a language by saying it's the set of all strings such that that string has more ones than zeros. In general, if I have some thing to compute, so if we have like, this is a thing to compute, if we're asking the decision version of this idea, of this, the idea of the thing we want to compute, this is going to be like a yes, no question about strings. So the decision problem is a yes, no question about strings. We could think of it as a function by saying it's gonna be some function f that goes from a string to zero, one, where the zero case is the answer equals false and then the one case is going to be the answer equals true. Or we could think about this as a language by saying it's the set of all the strings such that f of b equals one. So it's the set of all strings where the answer was yes or the function returned one. So for anything that you might have in mind that you want to compute, if you can think of it as a yes, no question, then you could think about it as a function that gives a Boolean output or as a language where the things in that language were all of the strings where the answer was yes. This means that we could think of XOR as being the language of all strings with an odd number of ones. We could think of majority as being the language of all strings with more ones than zeros. If we go back to this cover page, I could talk about this question, is it at least seven characters long? Is the string at least seven characters long? So as a language, that would be the set of all strings that are seven or more characters long. So that's what that decision problem would be as a language. This, is it empty? How many things are in the language that we can associate with this decision problem, is it empty? How many strings are in that language? Yeah, one string, what is that string? Yeah, the empty string is the only one for which the answer here is yes. So in that case, there is but one string in that language. Yes. You can have infinite languages. For instance, how many strings are in this is it at least seven characters long language? So there's an infinite number of strings in there. So I can't just exhaustively say, is this equal to any of the strings that's in that infinitely long language? We have to do something else. And that's where computing really starts to get interesting, is when you start saying, there's an infinite number of possibilities here when there's an infinite number of possibilities, how do I know that I'm looking at one? You can say pretty much anything there. 
it's very open-ended what you're allowed to fill in the blanks with. And that is powerful because you can now use this idea of a language to talk about lots and lots of different computations or things that you might want to compute. However, it also means that you can very easily get yourself saying nonsensical things or things that are way more complicated than you might have anticipated before. Some of the things that are on this slide, you're not going to be able to do with a computer. Some of the things you are going to be able to do. For instance, is this program going to halt? That is something that you could never have a computer determine for you in the general case. Is the program eventually going to print high? That is something that you could also never write a program to do in the general case. So some of these are pretty easy to compute. Some of them are hard to compute. The idea is that this, this uh, construct of a language is just a quick way of describing a computation that is very related to what we saw as functions. And this is gonna be handy going forward. So for much of the rest of the semester, we're sort of gonna be talking about languages as the thing that we're computing, but know that when we're talking about languages, they have this relationship with functions. When we say to compute a language, we're really saying, I want to compute this function that returns zero for the things not in the language and one for the things that are in the language. So that's largely what we're going to be working with going forward.